Yeah, welcome to another Lone Angler podcast. I'm Patrick. Um, before we get started with my awesome guest here, I wanna I want to uh, thank Dale Luganbill from Full Scale Outdoors podcast for the introduction and uh, for this podcast actually. Um, and uh, what we're gonna talk about, I'd also like to preface. Uh, that you go and find Dale Lugan Bill's uh, Full Scale Outdoor Podcast and listen to the episode with Tyler Winter. That is my guest this evening. And uh, welcome, Tyler. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's been a it's been a great and very exciting day. And, uh, you know, it's cold weather. And uh, building ice just makes me think about melting ice in springtime. So <laughs> um <just laughs> thinking, thinking ahead, trying to... Stay positive. Yeah. Uh, I had to dig extra, extra deep in some really shallow pockets this morning because we were uh, minus 37 without the wind this morning here in Bemidji. Um, when it hits that cold, it seems like spring is on the other side of the universe. Right. But you know what? Like you can't – spring is my favorite time of the year to fish, and you can't have spring if you didn't, if you don't have winter. <laughs> no truer words have ever been spoken. Um, I try to tell myself that to to remain positive. And even though I love ice fishing, uh, it, you just don't go out and stuff like this. Um, I always actually had, I hope my boss isn't listening, but I actually had my fingers crossed that, that the car was completely frozen and I had to wait a few <laughs> hours to get in. Because um, at, at, at 4.30 in the morning or quarter to five in the morning, I live downtown Bemidji and I have to walk down on the street across the block and into the parking lot to start my car. So when it's that cold, needless to say, by the time I get the car started and get back up here to the apartment, I don't need a cup of coffee to wake up. I am fully awake and aware of everything. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself uh, to my listeners and then we'll, uh, we'll start talking about something. Well, um, you know, I'm just a, uh, just a guy who really likes to catch fish and I suppose, um, I, I somehow have actually gotten to, to do some of this kind of stuff now, um, because actually about two years ago now I was on a, uh, a fishing show with, uh, the meat eater with, uh, Callahan and Miles Nolde and, um, you know, all of a sudden then it's like, well, people, you know, you're on the riverbank, you're fishing for buffalo, they're able to kind of guess who you are. Um, so that, that's kind of cool. And then I got to do another show with them, uh, beside fishing, and I got to uh, take Joe Cermelli, uh, the, uh, another meat eater guy and the former editor for Field and Stream. And uh, I, I talked him into going fishing for Red Horse with me. Um, and that was great. Um and so I've just been trying to spread the word. Um, the Red Horse uh, thing was actually kind of funny. Uh, he does a, a series B-side fishing, and he one of the first episodes he did was Chain Pickerel. Oh, and he, okay. He, and he, he's just like, well, you know, everyone hates Chain Pickerel, you know, because they're small, they're, you know, toothy, whatever. And he's like, I just think about it like fishing for brook trout, you know? Like, you're not going to get any monsters, but you're going to get a lot of them. And I was like, I'm like, well, yeah, that's why I fish for, like, Red Horse, you know? Like... <laughs> Like, you know, although like some of them are monsters, but like, you know, that's the same thing. So I, I pitched the idea to him. I'm like, you should come fish for a red horse. You know, it's kind of the same sort of thing. Like, they're not that popular, but you get them all to yourself and you can catch a bunch of them, you know, mm-hmm. and in size. Like, and he was like, he bit. So got to do that. And that was another great experience and got to, to showcase some, some rare fish and some good fishing and make fish tacos. And so, yeah, I got uh I you sent me a link and uh I feel kind of a little bit guilty cuz I do consume a ton of YouTube, but believe it or not, I do not watch a whole lot of fishing on YouTube. A majority of my fishing is across the Atlantic Ocean over into Europe. And yeah. just because of my fascination with other species of fish, it's brought me over to Europe. And, um, and, and even beyond Europe, uh, I've watched, uh, some stuff I've, I've, I've learned, I think in a, in about a year's time here, I'll have 
been able I've watched so much and and read so many closed captions that I could uh I'd be willing to bet that I could probably handle a little bit of uh German, Dutch, uh and a little bit of French as well. <laughs> yeah. I can't I can't watch I can't watch fishing shows either. Um, you know, uh so many of them are are geared around uh somebody who gets to fish 5 days a week with uh tens of thousands of dollars of electronics uh in a boat that's fifty thousand dollars catching smallmouth bass that are 14 or 16 inches long and then telling you that what you need to catch those bass is this particular soft plastic you know and i'm like and i'm like you could throw sticks at those bass like you know especially if you've got those electronics to know where they are and you'll be you'll do just as well you know, and I just, I can't handle it. Like, I, I cannot handle those sorts of fishing shows. I'm really, like, and that's also part of why I did the DOS boat and did the B-sides, because, like, they're not that kind of show. Right. You know, and that's what really brought me to those. So th- th- those are about the only thing I can stand to watch, because, like, yeah, you know, it's, you get got a boat like that, and it's, you it's, fish all the, all the time and I get, pristine I, places. Would it be fair to say that that it's a little bit more realistic, you know that, that yeah i mean like yeah. like yeah dospo and b side like they uh if they if we struggled you see it you know mm-hmm. like in that, that b side episode we it was hard um if you watch the current rip around me you could see i'm like struggling to work my to like keep my footing um and that, that was one of the worst days river red horse fishing i've ever had uh like but when I pre-fished that, uh, uh, when I pre-fished that before the show, I had eight of them. And the, the biggest one was 28 inches. Dang. It literally would not, it would not fit in my net. Like okay. I, I went and bought, I went and bought a steelhead net for the show because I didn't want to have that happen again on, on film. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I kind of understand. I think that's where part of my gravitation towards European style fishing is, um, a lot of it is done from shore. A lot of it is done Mm -hmm. from flow tubes or what they call belly boats or kayaks. Um, and, and just through watching this stuff and, and, and you get to see what Europe is kind of like firsthand from a GoPro, you kind of understand why there isn't trucks and there isn't giant boats. People, a lot of people over there live in apartments. The, yeah. there, there's no, there's no land left. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so these guys have become masters of fishing public waters from shore and catching big fish. And there's not even a lot of public waters all the time. Correct. Like that's, we should not take that for granted that like, you know, and I think that's probably also part of like why American anglers have, uh, gravitated towards like fast fishing is because there's space right like Correct. if you're not catching fish here or catching the fish you want to catch here you just move right and so like the when i see other you know boat anglers coming by me they're always like in a hurry right so they're working up the bank and actually like in the in the b-side fishing episode you'll there's a cut i mean like you see a boat going up the river where we were fishing like we watched that person fish all the way past us and they didn't catch actually anything, <laughs> but they were working hard at it. Right. Right. Um, so like my style of fishing almost kind of splits the, the difference. Cause I, I've also, um, the European style of fishing is kind of, um, uh, inspiring. Like we have a lot more space than they do. They, you know, we don't have like a peg, you know, or like a set spot that we paid for for the day to to fish from. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really like to key in on a particular spot, you know, and like I will take people fishing for the first time and they're wondering why I'm walking 100 or 200 yards up the river um, to like whatever. And I'll like point out, like, if you look at the shore here, right, like there's a transition from like rock to sand, which tells you that there's like a change in the current, Mm-hmm. you know or whatever like the thing is but i'm like this spot is the the spot you know and i'm like all right now we're gonna fish here angle downstream whatever and like hit this current break and you know there's fish there 
but like you have to find that spot. So like I go running all over, you know, uh, especially for fish that don't chase, you know, a, don't chase a lure. Like, you know, you're not going to, you can't fish that fast for them. Oh yeah. Um, you you definitely you find, have to slow spot. down and take your time. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. But if you do and you find a good spot, then you don't have to move. Right. Know? Right. So, um, it's speaking of, uh, your style of fishing. Now you, you primarily, um, fish for, and we're going to get more into this in a little bit here, but, uh, rough fish, quote unquote, rough fish. I, uh, well, yeah, well, I'm going to save the, the, that part for, for a little bit later, but, but your, your, um, your various suck, uh, suckers, your red horse. Now suckers and red horse are two different things. Depends on how you, depends on how you define it. So I have a, like, I went to school for, to be a biologist. That was my first, like my childhood dream was to be a, be a fisheries biologist. Um, so the family catastoma day mm-hmm. includes the suckers, the red horse, the buffaloes. Like those are all, so like at that level, they're all suckers. Okay. Gotcha. So like, and then like red horse is a genus, a genus. like the genus Moxistoma. And those have larger scales than like the white suckers, mm-hmm. right? And like the those long nose suckers and like those suckers that we call a sucker. Um, but yeah, so the red horse have like really like kind of reflective scales, the little larger scales. Some of them have red tails, but actually not all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, uh, so we actually have six species in Minnesota of, of red horse. I, those are also like the, the river red horse and the greater red horse. Those are like, big fish those get up to be like 10 pounds and 30 inches long um which isn't usually what people think of when they think of a sucker right um but yeah that's you know i love tying into a fish like that because you know how often you get to sight fish a 10 pound torpedo (laughs) right right well my appreciation for suckers or red horse um kind of dates back to my childhood uh we used to spear them when we were mm-hmm. kids and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that now because I'm, uh, you know, I, I'd rather catch them on a rod and reel. Um, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't until I started fishing the rainy river more often. Matter of fact, it was one sturgeon trip that I set the hook on a sturgeon rod. I saw this thing bounce, it bounce, the rod tip was bouncing. It was pulling pretty good. I get it up and my, my buddy in the boat was like, Oh man, it's a sucker. And I'm like, oh my god, get this thing in the boat. That's yeah. and then it, it just kind of it, it just kind of hit me like a brick in the face. Like, wow, what an amazing fish! Now, with that being said, I'm holding on to this thing, and I'm also very aware of the Minnesota Master Angler Program, mm-hmm. and I've been trying to chip away on that list. And so we take some pictures of it, take a measurement of it, and now I've got to figure out how to identify it. Because I did mm-hmm. know that there are different types of red horse. Mm-hmm. I, I ended up sending a picture, that picture of that fish, to my buddy Scott Mockintoon. I don't, do you know Scott? That name sounds really familiar. He's a fisheries biologist in, in around Hastings, okay. Minnesota. A really awesome dude. And I was like, hey, Scott, uh, can you help me identify this? And he said, do you have a picture of, his, of, of the lips? And I said, unfortunately I don't. And he, he, a few minutes later, he messages back. He's like, I'm 99, me 98, 99% sure that is a silver red horse. And it was like 23 and three quarter inches. Mm-hmm. And I was pretty excited because, uh, the master angler list, I think you just need 20 or 21 for the mm-hmm. silver red horse. And that kind of set the, the, um, that, that set that in my head now, like, okay, I want to, I've got silvers. I want to be able to identify the other species. And I've learned since then that there are some red horse species that we do not have up here in Northern Minnesota that I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah. And suckers yeah. too. So, um, that's what kind of set me down this path. Well, that and growing up fishing for bullheads. Yeah. Uh-huh. When I was a kid, I didn't have a boat. My dad, he liked to fish, but he didn't own a boat. And 
he really didn't fish all that much, but I wanted to go. And I think it was some, some elderly people in a small town that I grew up in are like, well, why don't you go fish bullheads? And, uh, an older gentleman showed me, you know, how to rig, rig it up, just plain hook and some split shot and f- just lay it on the bottom. And that's what I did. And I started catching these fish that I'd never seen before. And they're like yeah. little tiny catfish. And I became fascinated with it. And to this day, I still go and target bullheads. Right. Like the, I, I came from a little different point of view. My, uh, my dad actually, he still doesn't know how to fish. Like the, um, he will, I mean, if he listens to this, he'll, he'll, he'll support me on this. Like, um, so I, I taught myself, right. Mm-hmm. And then I taught him. Um, and so I, I came at a lot of this with no preconceived notions, right? Like, which almost no Minnesotan comes at this with no preconceived notions, right? Like we all, <laughs> we all know, we all hear from very early on, mm-hmm. you know, um, about all these different fish, right? Well, I didn't. And so I didn't know any better, right? So like, and so I just like, you know, and I took ichthyology and like, I just wanted to catch them all, you know, like I remember sitting in ichthyology class, looking at a, a hog, a hog sucker and being like, these fish are shaped like a F1 race car. You can <laughs> see how they're like design, like how they stick to the bottom, you know, like that's, they get this goofy shaped head. Like they're the only fish in Minnesota that has like a divot in their forehead. Right. Mm-hmm. And it like creates mm-hmm. downforce like on a race car, right? So they stick to the bottom. They got these big pectoral fins. And you can, if you see them in the river, they will be in the fastest current they can find, not moving, right? It just looks like a magic trick. Like they just stick to the bottom. No effort. I remember sitting there, like looking at this preserved fish being like, this is so cool, Mm -hmm. you know? But I'm like, I'll never catch one. You know, like where'd you even find one, right? (laughs) I ran, you know, I fell in with a bad crowd who did fish for them. You know, the roughfish.com guys, I fell in with them and they're like, oh yeah, we catch those. Well, next thing you know, it's, you know, just my, my life just turned into night crawlers and thinker slides and, you know, heavy, heavy weights, heavy, big custom, custom slinky sinkers. And, um, you know, now I've got, uh, 50 Midwest species under my belt. So dang, uh, that's awesome. That, that's no minnows either. I don't do, I don't do micro fishing. Uh, how come? I have a dip net. Okay. Interesting. Like, they're really cool. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. I own a dip net to catch them, but I don't need to do it on a hook. So, okay. <laughs> I just scoop them. <laughs> well, they're so, like, I actually, I, I was working with a kid and uh, he is a bit, he loves to fish. He, he's, he's a, a multi-species angler. Matter of fact, he, um, he ended up quitting Glacier and he got a job with the Department of Natural Resources and he's an aquatic vegetation uh, person. And uh, one day we're, um, we're at break or something and I come out to the break room to visit him and he goes, hey, do you know what this is? And he holds up his phone. And I just so happened to be looking at my um, Fishes of Minnesota book. And I said, Henry, that is a log perch. That's the book. Yep. And uh, he dropped his phone on the table and he says, oh, my God, you know what that is? And I said, well, absolutely. Most people don't know. Well, he mm-hmm. got into micro fishing. You know, just the challenge of catching them on, on, on hook yeah. line. And I haven't done it yet. It's something that interests me, but right now what's taking over my mind is fly fishing. Mm. Um, and I've learned uh, yeah. too, that fly fishing, you can catch any species that swims in Minnesota on a fly rod. I mean, that's what they say. Mm-hmm. I mean, like. There's a little catch I- though. There's a little catch, Tyler. <laughs> You can catch any fish in Minnesota with a fly rod. But when somebody says catch it with a fly rod, they instantly think that you're going to be presenting a fly. Oh, that's, you know, 
And I should know better because I've definitely put a worm on a fly rod before. Right. And I've learned, too, that there's a thing called Euronymph fishing, which is basically ice fishing jigs on a fly rod and you drift them down. So, you know, technically speaking, yeah, you can. Um, I don't yeah. know about like lake sturgeon or anything like that, but, you know, c- no. channel catfish are, are often a bycatch on like Lake Erie for guys fly fishing for smallmouth. Hmm. Absolutely. They will attack yeah. a streamer fly. Um, I've, uh, I've definitely caught buffalo. Uh, I've caught big mouth buffalo on a fly rod um, with a, a, just a foam hopper because they, uh, although they don't key into a hatch per se, mm-hmm. they are very particular about how their food moves. Mm. Like that, that was kind of the, the key for me to unlock the big mouth Buffalo thing. And that's like how the DOS boat thing happened was like, they needed somebody who could catch one. And I was like, yeah, I, I can do that five, six days out of seven. Um, so like when they want to film a show, that was very exciting. They were like very happy to hear that. Um, like, but the trick is like, because big mouth Buffalo eat plankton mm-hmm. or like, um, where I like to fish from, they'll come up to the surface and they like graze. They do not expect their food to move. Right. Okay. Yep. In, in my experience. Now I know other people like in different populations may be different, but in my experience, my home waters, they will not chase their food. And if their food moves, they decide that it's probably not food. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, they'll be like coming along and I'm like dangling a, a bait like in front of them. And then, like, if I move it to try to like adjust and get it in front of them, they will like drop down or they'll veer off. And then like, you have to start the whole process over. So, and like, it's really fun to take people like big mouth buffalo fishing. Cause like they'll, they will show up on the bank and they're like, well, they're right here. And I'm like, they are right here. That's why we keep this real quiet. <laughs> like, um, and I say like, I'm going to have a beer. I got the net here. I'll give you an hour. And then, uh, if you haven't got one in an hour, then I'm probably going to like, see if I can get one. And they're like, well, I mean, like there's 30 of them. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you see the like will turn as like, they're doing their own color commentary of like, well, wait, it missed it. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. Yep. And they're like, wait, they're missing it on purpose. I was like, yep. uh Uh-huh. Like, (laughs) (laughs) they're like, like realizing like it, it's not random. Like that they're like, they're coming along and then like they come up to your fly and they just duck under a few inches and come up on the other side and keep going. They don't act necessarily like they're afraid of you probably because they're big enough that they're not that easily intimidated, but like they know their food doesn't move. Right. And so you can't just cast it right in front of them because they'll see it slap down and they go, Oh, not food. Like they're one of the most frustrating fish that I've ever like, like ever figured out. It's they're infuriating. Like, I have never physically seen one in person. I've never held one either. Um, I I know that we don't have them up here in northern Minnesota. I don't think around the Bemidji area. Then again, well, then again, Lake Bemidji is just an uber wide part of the Mississippi River. Yeah, and they are in the Red River drainage in the and up into Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels like you should have had them. Although, according to the Great Minnesota Fish Book, big mouth buffalo were wiped out from the Upper Mississippi River for a hundred years. They were gone. Okay. So, um, they maybe only are uh, coming back. But yeah, commercial fishing and pollution um, wiped them out from a stretch of the Mississippi. No, commercial fishing, as in for human consumption. Well, this was a back a hundred years ago. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the market was, but I mean, back in the day, they, you know, they just killed fish left, right and center, you know, like that was just, um, so yeah, like, you know, some of it was certainly for fertilizer or animal feed or people or whatever, but like there were no limits, you know, like there was no, 
there's no license required or anything. They just, you know, just commercial harvest. fishing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like we have all seen all the, the big old stringer photos of all the fish that used to be that big. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's still some posted up in bars around here, you know, and and I've years ago when I many years ago when I used to go to the bars, you know, I'd, I'd be there and hanging out and I'd always hear an old timer be like, man, those were the good old days. And hmm. I always just kept yeah. my mouth shut. But. Well, I wanted to say, well, <laughs> that's because this took place in the good old days where you have, you know, you have a 12 foot two by eight, you know, nailed between two birch trees and, and the smallest pike on there is 15, 15 pounds and there's got to be 30 pike on there. Right. You know. Yeah. The, the, the early accounts of how good the fishing was, you know, when they were using, you know, cotton lines and, and whatever, and yet they're catching so many of these big fish. It almost kind of like uh, it lets you know that like the idea that we have to like control so and you know so called rough fish to have good fishing like it proves that wrong right because mm-hmm. like nobody was controlling rough fish before like the state of Minnesota started like trying to control rough fish right like and then like people came here and were like wow the fishing's amazing mm-hmm. like well, yeah that was with buffalo you know like <laughs> right <laughs> like that. Like that was with all of like the red horse and suckers and whatever, like, like, and the fishing was great. Yeah. Yeah. And like, then they like, you know, uh, said about trying to like, let me literally the, the Minnesota DNR at one point had a rough fish removal unit and they said, you know, their goal was to minimize the populations of these fish, which people were harvesting for a profit, which is kind of like, you know, being a timber company that's trying to minimize the number of trees you have. It doesn't make much sense. No, it doesn't. And that actually leads into one of the questions that I have is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about value for fish and I'm wondering, and I have, I guess my own ideas about what people value when it comes to fish, if it's appearance, if it's, quality of of table fare or is it tourism money or Mm -hmm. is it all those things combined what what's your take on the value when they say you know well this you know the walleyes are valuable Mm -hmm. i mean i think traditionally what really brought value to a fish was that it would bite a lure right was Mm -hmm. it like it that it was easy to catch right like I know there's a lot of people who are listening who are probably going to like scoff at that, but like, you know, if a fish eats a shiny piece of metal, it's not that hard to catch. Sorry. You know, sorry. But, but like, that's fun. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you. Like fish that bite shiny metal are fun. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I like catching lake trout as much as anybody, maybe more, but like, that's fun. So like, yeah, you got a fish that, uh, is, you know, will bite a lure. I mean, actually, one one definition I did here, you know, uh, was rough fish were fish that would not strike at lure or bait, you know, like they were harder to catch. Mm-hmm. Right. So, like game fish are game for being caught. Like, oh, interesting. Right. Like mm-hmm. that, that one. That's one thing about it. Right. Is like it's fun to fish for them, you know, like. But yeah, like pike are bony, you know, but like, yeah, so like part also is like food like traditionally you know was like a walleye makes a very nice mostly boneless fillet of just the right thickness to fry um but that's also a pretty old idea considering that like you know we also used to eat a lot of bass and we don't anymore right Mm -hmm. like trout were considered like were very popular because they're very tasty and now you know it's all hashtag keep them wet you know release wild trout um you know so there's there's plenty of people who go fishing who i don't think even own a fillet knife anymore well i I can tell you right now i probably have maybe four meals of fish a year and it's not because i don't like the taste of them uh i just i prefer the the fight i prefer the challenge um 
you know, and like I said, I, I will keep some fish and eat and, and I've also taken it upon myself. I've, I've bought the conservation license since mm-hmm. it came out. Um, so I'm only, you know, half the bag limits because I don't need, I've never needed a limit of fish. Mm-mm. Um, and I was uh, last summer I had my daughter here and I introduced her to flow tube fishing. And one night we went out and we were going to ke- ke- uh, catch some bluegills to eat. And I said, we only need four. And she was like, that's it. I said, yeah. we'll see. We only need four. And we kept four in that nine to nine and a half inch range, which some people mm-hmm. would freak out about. But it's a it's a private lake that I fish and, and it needs those that year class needs to be thinned out. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, but she got to see and we we ate those fish and we were we were content, we were full, and she got to see that, yeah, okay, the limit is, you know, twenty, but mm-hmm. for, for two of us, we definitely do not need twenty fish. Um no. A matter of fact, largemouth bass are one of my favorites to eat through the ice. <gasps> yep, oh I said God. it right here on the internet. Um, You're going to edit that out, though. No, absolutely not. Whoa. Okay, well, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> I usually just, I usually, out of that same lake, I'll keep two of them that are, you know, 14, 16 inches through the ice. They're nice and cold, and they taste wonderful. Yeah, they taste really, really well. I've heard smallmouth bass. I have not eaten a smallmouth bass, but I've heard they're even better yet, and it kind of makes yeah. sense because they eat a lot of the same things walleyes eat. Right, and they're a deep cold water say fish. That the only time I ever eat smallmouth bass is if I'm in the Boundary Waters and I can't catch lake trout. Mm-hmm. And so smallmouth bass always have a sort of like subtle aftertaste of failure. <laughs> <laughs> I I can understand no, that. I'm, I mean, like we didn't get if it's yeah, it's two o'clock and we don't have any lake trout. It's like, well, guys, we got to go find a bass. <laughs> we got to go find a rough fish. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, so to speak. Oh I mean, I live up here in musky country, and I know people that have eaten musky. Yeah, I mean that is was the original purpose, right? I do often wonder though. So, like, I get. Um, probably the two questions I get the most often are, is that a carp or is that a kind of carp? That's my favorite version of it. Is that a type of carp? I'm like, no, because there's only one. There is common carp. And like, that's all we've got right now. Right. Like, so I'm, I'm holding a fish that has scales on it. You can, yeah. But no, not a carp. And then the other question I always get is like, well, what do they taste like? Or can you eat them? And I'm just like, do you ask the musky guys that? Like you go ask the musky guys what muskies taste like, yeah. You know, I don't, I've asked people that, like, you know, and they're like, "Well, I thought muskies taste like pike." I'm like, "Don't ask me. Go ask the musky guys." I, <laughs> like, I would. You I go would. ask the musky guys what muskies taste like. Well, I don't catch muskies. You go. Right. Well, but like, in, in, that, that always cracks me up. Like, you know, like the the person who's got the thousands of dollars of electronics to go catch and release bass. And nobody thinks that's like odd, right? Like that's normal now. That guy is famous. Like that's cool. Uh oh. Electronics pay off, you know, on a pound per pound basis. But, you know, I'm out there, you know, like catching 16, 20 inch fish off the river, having a great time for, you know, cost of a dozen worms and people are like what are you doing having fun right right (laughs) you know and and, fish i mean i i've owned boats i've you know i have you know and you know a couple of vexlars you know and and the the higher end models and stuff and they they help and they aid and and i've always looked at it like this too there's and I think there's a lot of emulation going on in the, in the fishing world. So you, you see the, the bass guys, these guys, they do this for a living. They have a mortgage that they need to pay for, you know, they Mm -hmm. have families. This is their job. And, 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 and that's great. And I, and I think it's really cool that you can make a living 
not a living I would choose. At one time when I was a kid, I thought, man, I want to be on the cover of Bassmaster magazine. Yeah. And I don't know. I just kind of grew out of it. Thankfully, good to have that dream. But there's an immense amount of pressure. You know, it's a sport. It's, you know, you're relying on on catching five bass every day for three days in a hope that you get enough money to pay your bills. And Mm -hmm. the, and I think the emulation comes along when you see that, oh, it's, I've got to have all this stuff Mm -hmm. in order to be successful. Maybe you do, if you want to be a tournament angler and that's great. Um, but does it necessarily mean you, that's the only way to bass fish? Absolutely not. And that's what I'm trying to do. I sold my boat because I Mm -hmm. got back into flow tube fishing just for the mere fact of it, it's fun. I can access way different water than most people. And the other part of it was I wanted to show people that you do not need a boat. You mm-hmm. don't have to fish from a public dock or from shore or in a kayak, even though kayaks are very popular. They've come a long way. They're super expensive. But they also kind of scare people that have never been in one because they're tippy or they used to yeah. be. And, and here I'm, I'm, and everywhere I go with that flow tube, I get them. And if somebody's at an access, they, it's a half an hour talking. Mm-hmm. And right. I'm like, at the end of it, they're like, you really do. You have a boat that's under $200. You can go anywhere you want with it. And it fits in the trunk of your car. And I can go out and successfully catch fish. Now, yeah. if you saw my flow tube, you would probably be like, what? Because I do have a, I have a graph on my flow tube. That's oh yeah, I mean, like I got a graph when I fish for my canoe. You mm-hmm. know, I wouldn't fish for lake trout with that one. But the, I think the thing that I'm worried about, one of the things I'm worried about, big picture, right, is that uh, overall, now granted, you know, pandemic notwithstanding, but overall, like fewer people fish, right? Like numbers have declined. And that means that then there's less, like, of the political support, you know. And there's fewer people getting outside, caring about the environment. There's pe- fewer people who are actually keeping an eye on our water bodies and fewer people who are there to advocate for the environment, mm-hmm. for our fish, if there's less people fishing, right? People stop fishing because they don't catch anything, right? Mm-hmm. Fishing without catching anything is not fun. I don't care. Uh, uh, people who say that it's just for the experience or whatever, that's terrible excuse for people who can't catch fish catching fish is fun absolutely i'm not out there for the weather that's why i i deal with that at work i'm out there to catch fish yes i'm very serious about this i fish to catch fish N- not for sunsets like that's don't write me any hallmark cards about the beauty of whatever no i want to catch fish <laughs> i love it man yeah like i but people people stop fishing because they don't catch anything right and they, the only time they catch anything is when they go to the boundary waters or they go to some destination that's far away from everyone else where there are pl- still plenty of fish to be had, right? And maybe if we, div- you know, some of us diversified a little bit, like we might be able to find some good fishing close to home, maybe off a bank, maybe from a canoe or a float tube, and like, there's no harm in that. There's more people out there caring about it, buying bait, you know, buying licenses, helping to support the resources. You know, like, you know, I've taken so many people out who are like, oh, I haven't fished in years. Uh, you know, I don't like being on the sun of the boat. I'm like, no, come with me. We'll walk, you know, we'll, I'll take you to my good spot. Like, it'll be super chill. All you'll have to do is reel up fish. And then they're surprised when they spend the rest of their day reeling up fish, you know, Mm -hmm. and they're like, this is fun. And like, and not a single one of them has ever been like, this is fun, but like these fish all have lips. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in, in, I think you, you said it really, really, really well, not only on, on Dale's podcast, but also in the meeting that you were in today. Um, if I think if, if we, or 
those of us that enjoy catching multiple different species, including the quote unquote rough fish, that you, precisely what you said, catching fish. If we can get more people catching fish, regardless of what paint job and skeletal structure that they have, you would yeah. increase the angling. Do you think that the the volume of anglers now that, you know, because we had that, that sharp rise in, during the pandemic deal, you know, 2019, 2020, um, or was it 2020, 2021, something like that. I kind of forget. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, even here, you know, I go to L&M Fleet Supply and there wasn't a, there was like Eagle Claw Snell hooks left. That was it. There wasn't anything to be bought. Do you think that that those people did it for a couple of years and are kind of drifting away from it now? Oh, I, I, not all of them, but a, a, a percentage of them, I'm sure. Well, it turns out that a lot of people actually don't catch fish. Mm-hmm. Um, like I've, I've actually read some studies on this and like, uh, actually there was, there was a, there's one, you can look it up. Creole limits in Minnesota proposal for change. Google it. Right. But yeah, like most people don't catch more than like one walleye a trip, if that, right? Like even sunfish, the number of sunfish that people caught per trip was never like a limit, right? Mm-hmm. And so like when, um, and like they say in there, like I think they're at the time, it was like maybe like an estimated like 2 million anglers total licensed, unlicensed kids or whatever in Minnesota, right? There are only 15 million walleyes they thought in Minnesota. If everyone took a limit, there'd be almost none left just right. one. Right. Right. So people, we're, we all pat ourselves on the back. I didn't take a, I never take a full limit of walleyes. I only take three every time I go. Right. But if you're that guy, you're still actually in like the 99%, right? Like mm-hmm. you are getting more fish than other people. People who don't get any fish eventually quit. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I think that that has been going on so long that a lot of people actually have really low expectations for catching fish. You know, I've totally talked to people who've been fishing at a spot for hours and haven't caught anything and think that patience is important to catching fish. And I'm just like, your dad lied to you. Mm-hmm. You need to move. Patience is how you don't catch fish. <laughs> like... <laughs> patience is i think when your dad when 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 our father said that to us it was just a test to see how much you could take right (laughs) yeah like that's not no you you develop a pattern and yeah if i'm if i'm in a spot for 15 minutes and like there's nothing going on it's like then there's nothing going on it's time to move like something's off like um that's you know but like that Part of that, too, is like, you know, like I put a lot of time in on the water. You know, my day job is water quality monitoring. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I'm able to put those patterns together about, like, where fish are going to be based on where how high the water is, what the water temps are doing, things like that. And I fish really close to my house a lot, okay. like 18 days in a row. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I'll, I'll go to the same spot every day for two weeks in part because I can, because I, I make fishing also fun for my family so that I get to go more. And like, you, you can track the, the activity, you know, day in, day out and be like, okay, yeah, it's still rising. Like tomorrow's going to be even better. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, no, right. you're collecting yeah, data. Like, right. You're just kind of observationally like, all right, this run is just starting, you know, and like, all right, now we're, we've peaked and whatever. It's like, well, now the Creek's empty that means the fish are out in the river, you know? So like you're, you're trying to hit that spot, hit the right spot, you know, every time that you're not, you know, you're not having bad days. Um, but most people aren't able to do that. And they, they, they don't think of fishing in that way of like, you know, try to do that. But you know, if they're not catching fish, it's eventually not fun. And then, you know, rods go in the back of the garage and, they don't buy a license one year and then they can't go, you know, and it's like, that's a shame, you know, yeah. there's still fish to be had, you know, right. And they're, they're, you know, I'm, I'm fishing in the twin cities, you know, like 
there's plenty of people around, you know, and I'm still getting into, and, you know, in my case, luckily an underutilized resource. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's not the case for for everybody or everywhere, but like there, there's some untapped gems around just because of you like, you know, fish has got a red tail instead of a gray one or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Going back to when you were talking about when you take somebody and they're like, can you eat this? Is that would would showing people how to, you know, prepare prepare suckers and sheep's head or or bowfin or bullheads for table fare? Is, would that be a good way to promote people to multi species angle and, and angle for some of these fish? I think I think it is, you know, I, because I think on um, to. For some people, you know, there's definitely a crowd of people who are just like the tug is the drug, catch and release is is great, and like they don't even want to bother with cleaning fish, right? Mm-hmm. And then there there are definitely people who are like, you know, if I'm not coming home with some fish to eat, then I'm you know might as well go pick flowers. And yeah, like if you, you know, part of it is like part of being a responsible harvester is you you should know what you're taking, mm-hmm. right? same rule applies to waterfowl hunting or whatever, you know, like you're harvesting something, know what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. We identify your target. Um, But yeah, like, you know, shorthead red horse are, are are pretty common, pretty widespread, you know, and yeah, they make a really good fish cake. I mean, you can make a fish taco and and do them too, if you, uh, you know, want to debone it, but man, I tell you deep fried like fish balls, like, I will eat that before I'll eat anything. Like I know I I watched your uh the B side fishing and I watched you prepare those and and you guys man they they did they look good. They they really yeah. did. Um Yeah, and like I've made those for um we like to have a we periodically have a, a Friday where we like break out the deep fryer and it's like we make yeah, you know, homemade corn dogs and, you know, like just it's like everybody bring everything you've ever wanted to deep fry. Right. <laughs> cool. I always make I make sucker sucker balls. And you know what? People love them. Yeah. Like and then it's funny, too. And people are like, well, what kind of fish is this? I'm like, ah, well, there's a uh, some white suckers in there. There's some shorthead red horse in there. There's a golden red horse in there. You know, like uh, I can't remember all what I got. <laughs> but like. But like they make, they're like a a good firm fish. You know, I fillet them, uh, keep them fresh. Fillet when I get home. I usually freeze them right away. Um, save them for Friday, and then yeah, I'll make a big batch of uh, uh, fish cake, uh, whatever soccer balls, and like get a cookie dough scoop. Um, the uh, if you roll it in panko breadcrumbs, and they come out more like a traditional fish stick. Mm-hmm. Um, get that crumbly crunch on the outside, but man, like that's like, I've had so many people tell me like, this is, this should be a state fair food. (laughs) Yeah. Like, and I'm like, you know what I need to do? I need to start a state fair food stand and then roll that money back into native fish conservation. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. I mean, um, there's something similar here coming back into the Bemidji area, you know, it's really popular for, uh, burbot eel pout, you mm-hmm. know? And when I first moved here in 2008, the la- prior to that, the last time I caught a burbot was with my dad at Lake of the woods. Back then people were throwing them on the ice. Yeah. And they, um, but now fast forward to 2008, move here for college, meet a few people. I meet uh, Jason Rylander. I'll just name drop him right here. Uh, I'm, we're playing darts, you know, or playing against his team. And he starts flashing around these pictures. And I'm like, what is that? And the last time I saw Burbit was Lake of the Woods Burbit. This is brownish, gray, ugly looking thing. Well, he, these are, he was like, well, this is a Burbit. I said, for real? Mm-hmm. And it's a really black or dark green and gold color. Just a tremendously beautiful fish. And I said, I'd like to catch one. He takes me out. I learn how to, to clean them. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he said to me, and I, and I repeat this, and I always give him credit. 
They do not taste like lobster. If they tasted <laughs> like lobster, there would be no burbot left. Right. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to catch them. They would have been netted up. Yeah. Long time ago. But they are extremely good. But oh, I yeah. wouldn't have never thought to angle for them had I not had that part of the table fare. Now, yeah. with that being said, I've I've caught, you know, hundreds of burbots since and I've only had maybe eight meals of it. Because mm-hmm. I just like to go out there and, and try to catch, you know, the biggest one I can and, and just appreciate them, hold them. You know, it, it sounds, quote unquote, romantic, but I do. I like to look at them and, and they're such a cool fish. And, and you only get to really see them for a short window out of the calendar year. Right. You know, yes. so by the time that that part of the year comes around again, it's been a year and you miss them. Right. No, if you... Uh... This is another one of those things where it's like there is a double standard, right? That if you are a bird watcher, that is a totally socially acceptable pastime. And if you explain that you catch fish or you fish like a bird watcher, you just have a you know rod and reel instead of binoculars, people are like, you know, look at you and then they like take their children and like scoot away from you in the park. They're like, he's 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 fishing for fish just to see them. Like children, get in the car. Yeah. Like he's odd uh, character. Right. And I'm like, you know, and I, I, I feel very similar that it's like, yeah, there, there's some, like for me, um, I like to catch a river red horse or a buffalo or something like that. And it's like, there's some that like this fish could, you know, like the, I've caught river red horse that like had like black age marks on them, which on Buffalo mean they're at least like 40 years old. Mm-hmm. We don't know if that is applies to river red horse because they're they're actually not common enough to like sample an age. Um, but it's like you hold this fish and you like look at it and you're like this is an old this is an old fish that has survived for whatever it's from before the Clean Water Act and somehow has persevered and it's it's gonna I'm gonna let it go it's gonna go eat zebra mussels and whatever and migrate up and down the river that's pretty cool. And I catch a buffalo. I let it go, and I'm like, that fish could live until my grandchildren catch it. You know, and my oldest is eight. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, like, like that. That's sort of amazing. Like, if you can't experience a little bit of awe from that, you know, or appreciate the fact that like that's an amazing thing that this fish is going to outlive you and live until your grandchildren can catch it. Like you should feel a little bit, you could feel not to get too wooey, but like, you feel like you could at least acknowledge that's neat. Cool. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a little bit of respect wash over you at that moment and realize that, and yeah, there might be something, something else, you know, going on. Um, right. And I mean, like worst case scenario, you could still like, eat a couple and be like, you know what? I really like fried fish cakes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, now I've never eaten sheep's head and I also target those around the Bemidji area. There are a couple of lakes around here that have them in there. Um, and I wanted to, but I was, I was told by a, a few people that, that have lived around here that the, the fish, the, the sheep's head in the lake um, is actually quite unique to have them in a lake up here and to get to the size that they get. I haven't caught anything under 24 inches and I've caught them up to 29 and a half inches. Wow. it's a big one. Yeah. Um, lots of, you know, the, the 26, 27s. Um, but I was told that those fish could be 50, 60 years old. Yeah. And there's a part of me that's like, man, that, that, that's been around before a lot of this water was cleaned up again. Yeah. And I kind of throw a little caution to that. Now, I don't mind taking and eating a few walleyes and saugers out of the rainy river, but I could, if I didn't have a conservation license, I could eat, you know, the, the, the legal sturgeon, the one that you can keep, but I don't know that I would even do that because yeah. even though the rainy river has come a long way, that used to be extremely dirty. Um, it's gotten a lot better, but there's just something about eating some fish that you know are slow growing and have been around a long time. And it's not because, well, they deserve to live because they're 40 years old. It's more of, 
man, this thing's been through some stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that's at least what goes on in my head anyway. Yeah. I uh, My personal rule is I don't want to eat anything that's older than I am. Because, yeah. like, if, uh, if I eat a fish that's older than I am, then, like, when are my kids going to have a chance to see a fish like that? Mm. That's, right? a, that's a great like, point. Like, I have to leave... You know, if it's going to take over 40 years to grow a fish like this, well, you know, so like that sturgeon are kind of off the table for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like to harvest stuff. You know, don't get me wrong. Like, I put uh, I put myself gutting a deer on my Instagram um, just to dispel any myths that, you know, uh, I'm a closeted PETA member or something like that. Like, you know, I, I like to go to the woods, go to the river and get food. It's very rewarding. Mm-hmm. Um, and satisfying, you know, and part of why I like to do that too, is like that, you know, connection back to the thing, like, you know, we depend on that, on that meat. Right. Um, and so like the, there's that value there, you know, and like that connection to things, my kids are growing up with the idea that like, we depend on these, on these resources. Um, you know, and I, I just, like whatever, you know, like, I don't, I mean, honestly, I don't even want everyone who listens to this podcast to go out and try to find Red Horse because like, I kind of like not having any competition. Well, yeah. I was going to, um, I was going to ask you about that as we go yeah. further into this. It's kind of like, we want people to catch fish and we want to promote these cool fish, but at the same time, it's kind of nice right now. When I go bullhead fishing, guess who has all the spots? Me. To your, right. But I will say, like, say this, like, you know, at the very least, you know, don't hate them. Right. Yes. That's that's all I'm really asking from anybody is just not to hate them. Right. Yeah. Like you don't have to go fishing for them. It's fine if you do highly recommend circle hooks, but just don't hate them. You know, and like the the I have heard so many I've heard that bowfin eat walleye eggs. You know, which based on their jaw structure, I don't even think is possible. Like they just have like a vice grip jaw. Like if they um, do eat walleye eggs, they're eating a walleye that has eggs in them. Right. Which actually, apparently, their 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 preferred food is actually crayfish. Who knew? Crayfish and sunfish, from my my research. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually found a paper though. This killed me. I loved this. They actually found a paper where they actually went to a walleye spawning reef, set nets, and dissected fish's stomachs. And yellow perch were, like, the thing that were, like, eating the most walleye eggs. Yes. Like, nine times more than the suckers they caught. Like, they caught four suckers in the whole study, and they caught more perch, and the perch ate, like, nine times as many eggs per perch. And I've never heard anyone accuse a perch of eating walleye eggs, because, you know, perch are good for the walleyes. There's favorite food. Well, yeah, there's yeah, there there's always that narrative that's spoken. Um, but perch are yellow perch in my observation and some of the things that I've read are well, one, I'm I'm thankful they don't get to twenty nine inches. I can tell you that for free. Um they're cannibalistic, very opportunistic feeders. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They'll they'll scoot into a bluegill nest, they'll scoot into a crappie, walleye. Um, you know, uh, matter of fact, uh, supposedly when the burbot are spawning, uh, perch come up and feed on those eggs as well. Perch are very mm-hmm. opportunistic feeders. And, and that, that's the other thing too, is if, if you could go and observe life underwater, you, I mean, fish are just cannibalistic period. Mm-hmm. Um, so to, to single out one species, like the muskie eat all the walleyes, mm-hmm. eh, they probably eat a few, but is it their main source? Probably not, you know? Right. Um, but will they eat one? Absolutely. If they're hungry, just like me, if there yep. is a pile of food on a counter and I'm really hungry, I'm not going to stop and be picky. I'm just going to grab something. Right. Well, you know, part of it too is like, I think that it's almost a universal human instinct to like not take responsibility. You know, I'm, I'm sure I do this too. Right. But like, we also like, as much as we would like to blame 
muskies for the walleye fishing or whatever, I like to blame eagles, you know, or cormorants, you know. I'm very fish biased, you know, so birds are, you know, um, I'll just blame it all on the bird. I usually like to blame humans. (laughs) Right, but you're the one, right? But, like, we also know, as anglers, we also know that the further we get from people, the better the fishing is, right? Like... That's like an, like, that is, you learn that, like, on your first fishing trip. You got to go far away from people to find good fishing, you know? And it's like, yeah, and people have done studies on this too, where it's like, yeah, the further you drive away from people, the better the fishing is. That effect is overwhelming any, you know, mu- musky density variation. <laughs> like, right. You no, know, but like, that's, you know, so it's like the, I think people probably should be a little bit more, uh, aware a little bit more circumspect about like our own impact on things you know and like yeah maybe don't you know keep pushing trying to catch you know one more of a fish that's rare in an environment like you know you're talking about like being conscientious about the blue hills you harvest or something like that like you know like on my section of the river i catch a lot of shorthead red horse uh that's great if I catch a silver red horse, I let it go. Cause actually my section of the river, I don't catch very many of those, mm-hmm. you know, they're bigger. If I just wanted, you know, to fillet fewer fish, I'd go for the silvers, but you know, like I also want to catch more silvers. So yeah, you don't have that population you know, density. Um, yeah. Try to be a little conscientious about it and, you know, don't take more than you, uh, don't take more than you have a use for, because even if you, you know, uh, don't have much of a use for them. Like the, my favorite Buffalo spot, there's usually an Eagle sitting in a tree over that spot and the Eagle's nest just across the river. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, you know, taking a ton of Buffalo out of this spot, well, that's Eagle food. I mean, it would be un-American to hate Eagles. (laughs) Like, yes. Right. Like if you're, it's like, you know, if you're out there, are you like, are you trying to starve the Eagles, dude? Are you a patriot? <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a good point. Well, and the other thing, and correct me if I'm wrong in my thinking, but I, I, I feel pretty confident in saying this, but this goes back to um, the Eel Pal Festival. Back in the mm-hmm. day, there was part of that whole festival was total team tonnage. Mm-hmm. Who killed the most burbot? God. Things have changed now. Matter of fact, the the city of Walker doesn't even sponsor the Eel Pout Festival anymore. It's kind of independently run. Um, but there's a lot of catch and release going on now, which is good. And I've and I've never attended it. One, mm-hmm. not a huge fan of you know five to seven thousand twenty some year old drunk people. Um, so much pain. Right. And the other part of it was I was always kind of like, man, I just don't really want to see that. Mm -hmm. They're starting to release now. But in my conversations with a few of the hardcore pout guys around here, we've and myself included, there's a checks and balances that goes on. And if you were to remove all of the burbot from the Leech Lake system, that balance is now off. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, you're going to get overrun with perch you know, crayfish, all the things that those rough fish keep in check. Yeah. You know, um, and I, and I, I wanted to ask you that if, if my, if my train of thought there is kind of off. No, I think you're, I think you're onto something that there's, um, you know, and one thing that I think is, seems to be universal in my study of aquatic ecosystems is that they're always more complicated than we think. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, as much as the science has improved, we still, we still, people do studies and do things and they find something unexpected. And we should have a little bit of humility and a little bit of caution before we start trying to go, like, push things in one direction or the other. Uh, we know that uh, ecosystems that have a lot of species are more resistant to invasion. We know they're more productive. We know that they uh, are more stable. 
and then um how do you say they're more productive like mm-hmm. you there are just just by having more species you have these benefits right and so you know l- l- have the species right just l- appreciate the fact that they're there and then you maybe would avoid some of the the problems we're having right like when you um you if you want to uh if you clear cut a forest you're going to have like room for weeds right if you go out into a woods now there aren't weeds right like because the trees shade everything and like all the nutrients are taken up so you don't get you know you you don't get new weeds popping up Mm -hmm. you may have a lot of standing biomass without a lot of like reproduction right Mm -hmm. but you can still appreciate that you know like like would you rather fish in a hayfield or fish in an old growth forest you know Mm -hmm. like um so yeah that's you're you're absolutely right that like uh that there i would say the one thing is that like that the estimating those impacts like isn't easy right because like it sounds like on one hand like well if you take out the eel pal something else will benefit but what that would be uh is very unpredictable right um the DNR actually did a study on Wilson Lake where they try to take out as many white suckers as they could. It was a simple system. It was walleyes, perch, and white suckers. Okay. And they set nets and they took out a ton of the white suckers. And the perch numbers boomed. And like you would predict, that had a negative impact on the walleyes because the perch got uh, ended up getting bigger and they started competing with the walleyes instead of being forged for the walleyes. And so, like, they're, you know, very logical. Like, well, yes, you know, we'll take out the suckers. Perch will benefit. Walleyes eat perch. You know, walleyes will benefit. And that's not what happened, mm-hmm. right? Um, because the, the perch did too well. I, I, and, I, I would be willing to bet that the perch, the population, outnumbered the walleyes. Yeah. But those sorts of studies, which were done back in like the 70s and 80s, actually informed the Minnesota DNR and they stopped doing those sorts of removals. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't apparently didn't tell the public, though. (laughs) Like. (laughs) And so I still, you know, can't fish in a in a park without having these conversations with people about why we shouldn't kill all the suckers. You know, it's like, yes, they tried that in the 70s. And they decided it didn't work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so yeah, you're you're right. And I think the the lesson people should also take away from that is that like it's a it's not a game that can be controlled, right? Correct. Uh, and that's that's the thing. So like, yeah, there's there are just benefits that we don't fully understand. In part, as you watch the testimony today, um, because these fish are really poorly researched. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of the research that I have found on them is actually just how to kill them. Right. Um, Would Let me ask you a question real quick. <clears throat> I know after watching watching that video, um, there... Maybe we should tell people what the video was. Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and... and yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and, and introduce that video that you sent me? I was good. Yeah. I was like, yeah. we know what we're talking about. Right. Um, there was today on, uh, February 3rd, um, when we're recording this, mm-hmm. uh, anyone wants to look it up, there was a committee hearing in the Minnesota House of Representatives, the Committee for Natural Resources, uh, Policy and Finance. And there is a bill, um, that was up for discussion that would, uh, require the Minnesota DNR to review the rough fish designations and write a report of recommendations. Um, And I uh, was very lucky uh, to testify in support of that bill. Um, It it turns out, you know, that these, as we've been alluding to, the rough fish list and and regulations are really just something that people made up about a hundred and some years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because, yeah, some fish were, uh, seen as popular and some unpopular. And then people decided that um, if you took out the ones that were unpopular, the other ones would benefit. 
And as uh, Dr. Solomon David said today, he's like, that's just completely unsupported by the science. Um, and if you do see those effects, they're usually unpredictable and they actually lead to worse fishing. And the more we study it, the more we find um, unexpected things of like one of the examples he gave was like that suckers migrating up rivers, fertilize the rivers and increase the productivity of the rivers, you know, so like maybe they ate a walleye egg while they were up there, but it's a net benefit to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So like they're transporting nutrients upstream, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a service they provide to us. We will see um, at least a review of that. Uh, we have 26 species of native, quote unquote, rough fish in Minnesota. And, you know, they're native. They all play important parts in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, some of them, like the quillbacks, are nearly impossible to catch. But mm -hmm. I've seen those being eaten by eagles more than I've probably seen any other fish eaten by eagles. Um, you know, so like... The uh, there's just so many of those sorts of things, and it's in my mind there's no native fish that should have a, a limit of unlimited. Correct. Um, because that that unlimited limit really informs people, gives people the idea that these fish have negative value. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that so many people have said, you know, well the DNR wants you to kill them. That's why they made the limit unlimited. And I'm like, they made that limit in like 1909. Um, like, and they just haven't changed it. <laughs> right. Like, well, and going back to the, the studies, a lot of the, the, the funding that goes into our fishery is goes towards the game fish. Preferably, mm -hmm. and it, being that we're in Minnesota, the walleye. It is mm -hmm. undoubtedly, and I'm not going to deny it, the number one sought after fish in this state. If yep. it was bluegill, we'd have bluegill stocking programs here or whatever. Um, how do we go about, or what do you think? Do you think that we will, that that funding in the future, or or should I say, let's hope that funding in the future. Part of that has started to being allocated for the other fish. I like to call them the other fish instead of rough fish. Yeah. No, and I feel the the rough fish thing is hard because there's actually there is a legal list. So like there isn't a biological thing, but there is a legal list. And that then like um you know, so if we have issues with uh fisheries management or whatever the fish that have the no limit limits and uh, no close seasons and whatever, like those are the most out of line. Um, so sometimes I, I use the term rough fish really for uh, to be, to be clear uh, or to, to avoid confusion, but I prefer native or non game yep. um, or other. Um, but yeah, one, one very good argument is actually that like the increasing popularity of the sport of bow fishing means that these fish are sport fish and therefore would qualify as Brad Parsons was talking about for the sport fish restoration program funding so that like we could do more just basic science um, and get some of those things. Um, that would require like a reworking of our regulatory structure, you know, because like, well, you can't shoot, you know, you can't shoot sport fish. Um, so then like that would take away the, those people who depend on those fish for their sport, mm -hmm. you know, like that would uh, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. So we would need some sort of new, new way to break down the, our regulations that makes space for uh, bow fishing. Cause it's not going to go away. No, um, and I, I don't want to see bow fishing go away. I, I, I would, if somebody tried to take fishing away from me, I'd be rather upset. Right. Um, no, and that's, uh, the, you know, the, I don't have a problem with, uh, with killing fish, obviously, because I, I kill fish and eat them. Mm -hmm. um, what I have a problem with is the idea, uh, a motivation 
by hating fish, right? Right. Like, uh, I don't, I don't hunt deer because I hate them. I don't hunt grouse because I hate them, you know? And if you, uh, don't have a respect for your quarry or at least an understanding that you need them to do the thing you love to do, you should kind of think about like what you're, you're trying to like get yourself out of a sport. Um, like, you know, you want it to be sustainable if you enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know what, I may get, I may get, uh, some hate mail or, or get some negative feedback on that, but that's a, that's a very good point in the fact that when it comes to bow fishing, you, you know, I, I've seen a lot of the pictures of, you know, three or four 55 gallon drums with tail sticking out of them. And I've mm-hmm. often pondered that very same thing that you just said, like, well, if you love to do this so much, then why are you going out? for six hours from midnight till 6 a.m. and sticking everything that you see. Mm -hmm. I never understood that. There is a common, there's a common, um, I often hear people talk about how there are so many, right? Um, Or they assure me that like they could never be wiped out. Um, Which of course history, like we only have to look to history to see that there are, in Minnesota that these fish were wiped out from different places and have started to come back in some of them, but like, uh, you know, between dams and pollution and commercial harvest, these fish have seen range contractions. They have been eliminated from some places in Minnesota. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are other fish that are like, like the blue sucker, right. Historically, they supported a commercial fishery. They were called sweet suckers and they supported a commercial fishery and they migrated up the Mississippi river. And today they are a species of special concern. And like they fishing, electro fishing crews will catch one, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're really, really rare. Um, so like the idea that like we could never exhaust these things is not true. The other thing that happens is like, uh, they call it catch hyper st- catch hyper stability because fish always concentrate in the best available habitat and fishermen are able to find that habitat. You are able to keep your catch rate high because you're like already in like this spot where fish concentrate. And then as you take fish out, it seems like your catch rate also still remains high, but you don't see the fact that you're actually depleting the rest of the population as they come to the really good habitat. So like, imagine if you were like fishing on a spawning migration, right? Mm -hmm. The number of fish in that spawning migration might be limited by the availability of spawning habitat. So like, you know, because the 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 gravel bar is only so big. So like you're like 200 fish there. You're like 200 fish, that's so many. Which is really just also like, uh, that's something like, it's a cultural based thing, right? It's not like even as a biologist or something like that, that I'm able to say 200 is a lot or not. Like we'd have to know, you know, a whole lot more things about the ecosystem. <laughs> right? People see that many fish and they go, that's so many. And then they start harvesting them. Maybe it's game fish. Maybe it's not right. But they start harvesting them. Well, soon enough, like they've actually, you know, fish keep moving in and they go, Oh, there's still so many. And then all of a sudden they stop moving in and all of a sudden they're out. And it's too late. Right. This is why fisheries collapse suddenly. Like this, this effect of catch hyper stability has caused fisheries to collapse in the ocean, all sorts of places like blue pike from Lake Erie that are extinct. Like this, this is why fisheries collapse. And that's completely possible to happen in a recreational fishery in the Midwest, like this can happen. I've talked to people on one of my, my favorite rivers who said, Oh yeah, we used to get big brown fish up here and we didn't know what they were. And then I met a guy who said, Oh yeah, we used to shoot big brown fish off this bridge and now we don't get them anymore. (laughs) Bingo. (laughs) I fished there for 10 years and I never saw what they were talking about. Huh. They were probably river red horse. 
That's probably what they were. And they probably swam up that tributary to spawn. And, you know, mm-hmm. uh, if there was one orgy a year, would you miss it? Like, no. no. Like, so the, that might be, you know, most of the fish from 10 miles downstream. Yeah, I was going to say that earlier when you said, wow, there's 200 fish. Well, that very well could be the only 200 fish. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about, you know, that, that whole decimation of the population. I mean, that happened in the, in the, you know, nineties up here, just North of Bemidji. Yeah. The walleyes became so low in population. All of a sudden, bam, there's 14 to 16, 17 inch crappies, as many as you can handle. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there's a, that's a really good example because those are all game fish. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, how you take happens. one thing out and another thing pops up, how it completely changes things around. Yeah. And then sometimes because, like, now you've got the supersized crappies or something, you suddenly, like, your walleye sucking doesn't work because, like, you've got crappies eating not just walleye fry, but walleye fingerlings, you know, because mm-hmm. they're cute or something. That is another thing that, like, history is full of is uh, trying to get that magic back trying to like restore a population and there are so many there's so many things around the world um you know that have not come back from atlantic salmon uh where they've been trying to stock atlantic salmon for a 100 years and atlantic salmon are still on the verge of extinction Mm -hmm. um you know it's like uh we don't have a skipjack herring in minnesota anymore or whatever where it's like once again like it pays to be cautious, right? It is much easier to protect a fishery in an ecosystem than it is to to recreate it. And it, I, I would, and I would be, it'd be, in my mind, it'd be fair to say it's, for lack of, you know, I mean, it would be cheaper. It's oh, cheaper yeah. to like, protect it than it is to restore it, because it seems like you know when we talked earlier about value of fish, there's. In this day and age, there's a dollar amount attached to 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 the walleye. Mm-hmm. I mean, it brings in tourism money straight up. Yeah. So there's there's that value there, and and if you, yeah, it's it's way cheaper to protect than it is to restore. Although there's also a dollar amount on white suckers because holy mackerel, it's meant to buy decoy sized suckers for musky fishing, and like those things, like pound for pound, are worth more than walleyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that, that's crazy. I, I remember I, looking at the ones like in the bay tank, and I was like, if I filleted that, that would be twenty bucks a pound. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, some of my close buddies always give me give me hell because the other fish that I eat is from from the frozen section, you know, at Target or Walmart, mm-hmm. and they're like, how can you? I said, you know what? At the end of the day, fish is fish, in my opinion. You know, it's usually mm-hmm. covered in breading and you put a bunch of salt and tartar sauce on it and down the hatch. Yeah. I said, one, they're always biting in aisle nine. Yeah. Two, I don't have to dull my knife and deal with guts. <laughs> I just preheat the oven and I throw them in and they're ready to go. Right. Um, but with, there's that, those are $4 or, you know, we'll just say $5 for a bag. Well, yeah. I've often wondered how much it costs me to go out and crappie fish for an evening. <laughs> it's quite yeah. expensive if you if you want you know, even if you rudimentarily rudimentally like break it down, it's an eye opener without yeah. getting too macro on it. Yeah, I never take the receipt at the bait shop. Like, oh, you want the receipt? I'm like, no, 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 well, you know, I don't. There's, the cost of the license, there's gas, there's time, there's line, there's hooks. Yeah. I mean, you can sit there and you can you can do it for hours and you'll find out that, wow, unlimited crappies. And then you say, well, okay, how much per pound? You're probably close yeah. in that $20 pound range. I also, I like, I like nice fishing rods. Like I got a, yeah, a, yeah, St. Croix rods, so... That's that's where my money goes. <laughs> Do you ice fish a lot, Tyler? Yeah, I don't spend my money on electronics. I spend it on nice rods. <laughs> there you that's go. The, now, like, 
let's let's talk a little bit about do you still are you still good or you you want to make a part two um well i think we got to talk about we so part of the way that this started was uh i I listened to one of your episodes on sucker fishing and i was thinking to myself that i was like i rig up the exact opposite of you and i just had to compare notes okay it was like like because you you were saying you were recommending mono um and i strongly recommend braid okay um and i also uh i think i use probably bigger sinkers than you like i usually start about a half ounce sinker and then go up um and i use smaller hooks okay i use like a number my go-to hook is like a number eight circle hook okay like i think for uh, yeah and we kind of we a little disclaimer here folks Uh, tyler and i've been chatting for a few days on the old (laughs) instagram swapping notes back and forth but at least around here, if I'm going to be uh, sucker fishing in the spring, there isn't a whole lot of heavy current. Mm. And then my idea behind using mono, one, I, I just, I'm a mono fisherman. I grew up with it. I'm comfortable with it. Uh, there's, I think my sturgeon, well, my sturgeon rig has braid. And I think I do have a, a setup that I use on the Rainy River that has braid. But other than that, I'm a pretty much a mono guy. Just because wow. I'm familiar with it, I've used it my whole life. Um, 15, 17 pound mono for bass fishing. I use it all the time for what I, how I bass fish, and it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but my idea of using like six or eight pound mono was, I was always afraid of ripping the hooks out of their soft mouth. You mm-hmm. know, especially up here where we aren't dealing with a lot of current. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from with the braid, but that that's my whole reasoning. Yeah, for that, and and I even use mono for when I'm bull, when I'm targeting bullheads. Even no, and that's one of the. I was talking to somebody, and they were like, "Oh, you're an expert," and I was like, "No, like I'm not." But that's also part of the great thing about rough fish or rough fishing, other fish fishing, is it like there aren't experts really, right? Like, um, and I'm constantly, you know, on the Instagram, like people, you know, see me out there and like they buffalo pictures with you know fish caught on jigs and stuff and i'm like i wish i could do that but mine won't bite jigs they're so like you know however you catch them that works works you know Mm -hmm. like you can you can figure this stuff out for yourself you know there isn't there isn't a a a book even that you can just go buy that's got all the answers in it you know um the one book that was ever written about it is out of print so (laughs) (laughs) Um, so like, that's part of, that's part of it is like, you know, you can, uh, you can borrow from the Europeans, you can, you know, borrow from this, you can make it up on your own. Um, and you can find what works for you. Um, what I, the one thing that I do, uh, I often get flack about, which, you know, uh, and you get a thick skin, right. Being like a multi-species angler. Yes. Like, uh, cause people are always ragging on you. <laughs> like, like I always get that. Well, they're really easy to catch. And I'm like, S- please tell me you're not a bass fisherman. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what? Um, I've always, the- I've had that, I've had that said to me before and I said, okay, well give me the seasonal movements of rock bass. Right. I'm still trying to figure it out. Because mm-hmm. I, through the ice, I've caught them in four feet of water. I've caught them in 40 feet of water. In the summertime, I've caught them in the weeds, and I've caught them in 26 feet of water off a rock pile. Mm-hmm. Tell me. You tell me. Or actively target suckers in July on Lake yeah. Bemidji. Tell me mm-hmm. where you would start. Where do they go? Oh, I'd just wait till you know, spring. Well, yeah. Well, I'm not going to call myself a bluegill fisherman if I'm pulling them off their beds either. <laughs> right you know the uh yeah so i always get like yeah well you know whatever that like they're too they're too easy to catch or whatever and i'm like oh, oh okay yeah because i mean like you know but the uh I, you know making it fun like catching them you know quickly and uh any time of the year or whatever um i put a lot of thought into like the technique and the approach and part of it is like i like a a high modulus rod. I'm particularly fond of the, uh, the St. Croix Avid series. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I actually got a, a custom rod made from uh, Thorn Brothers with a St. Croix Avid blank, and I had them put a, a special uh, grooved foregrip. So I have an exposed blank on my foregrip. Okay. Uh, and then the braid line and uh, a heavier sinker, I can feel that bottom transition like way out in the river. I can feel that tick, tick, tick and try to like stop my my worm, especially on like a current break where a, a fish might like rest or whatever. And I want to be able to feel that, that substrate from wherever I'm standing. Mm-hmm. And so like those three things together of the like a heavy weight, um, particularly like the, if I need the extra sensitivity, I'll go to uh, like a pencil sinker, pencil trolling sinker. Um, but a slinky sinker is less, way less snaggy, but yeah, if braided line and then smaller diameter. I can like stick, I can slow down and like get my, my worm to stick in a spot for uh, at least a couple minutes. And then like, yeah, with, uh, a nice fast action and uh, like really, light rod i could feel that tap 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 and a little uh, circle hook you don't need to to give a big whaling hook set to like make contact i've got some really big fish and a number eight circle hook yeah and that I, i'd be willing to bet that that's where it that braid really comes in because there's no stretch you don't have to really reef back on it mm-hmm. and their, their lips are actually like fairly leathery you mm-hmm. know like um, like one thing too, and like the, the river red horse, they have big lips, but like they, you know, will eat like whole freshwater mussels, right? Like, so they grip with their, you know, their mouth, their mouth is actually big enough to like get a freshwater mussel and pull it out of the gravel. Or they also seem pretty fond of crayfish. So I'm, I'm just convinced that like, sometimes they look at a crayfish and like, you're going to pinch me, but, uh. I have these big leathery lips and I don't care. <laughs> you know, like. And who knows? It might be like the cartilage on your ear. I mean, you really yeah. have to put a lot of pressure on it for it to hurt. Yeah. They, they seem, uh, they seem to, you know, like their, their lips like do a lot of, you know, do a lot of work. Uh, um, but yeah, those river red horse, that is the one actually, I definitely size my hooks up and I size my baits up. They don't like, they don't like a little bit of like a nibble, they're not looking for like mayflies and little like bugs in a rock. Uh, if you, you want to chuck like meat at them to get their attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's like one of the fun things about them is like, you know, they, uh, they definitely will like see something like that, like a, a crayfish, uh, like I'll take a catch a crayfish and like cut its head off or something like that. And like bounce that by them or something like that. And they'll like turn and like hunt for it. Um, yeah. not like, some of the smaller red horse where it's like, like they're like kind of like hunting around or whatever. And it's like, if they get to it, they will. And you're just like watching or waiting. It's like river red horse. they like, they want like steak dinner. Like right. they go and get it. So. Very, it sounds very similar to, well, kind of, I guess like sturgeon, mm-hmm. you know, they're like sturgeon. Have you ever sturgeon fished? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of bait on there. You need a lot of scent and just kind of hope that you get it in their pathway. Yeah. Um, um, and there, that, that's also a misconception with, with catfish, catfish, especially channel catfish, they'll hit crankbaits. They'll hit mm-hmm. jigs. They're actually a little more, not so much bottom feeder, you know, same thing, bullhead, your browns, mm-hmm. yellows and, and blacks. If they were a bottom feeder, they wouldn't have the skeletal structure that they have. Their mouth faces mm-hmm. forward. Yeah. They're a predatory fish. Yeah. The Actually, the other thing, too, uh, I often hear the bottom feeder thing. And uh, red horse will not hit, and suckers will not hit stinky worms. Like, if your worms die, you will not be catching suckers that day. I keep ice packs, like, I, and my worms live in a cooler all the time and i've had days of fishing ruined because something like the worms have lost their like gotten like soft and not even that smelly yet and you're just like all you catch is catfish mm. and it just you're know, like oh great and it's gonna be one of those days the uh so yeah ice packs on my worms uh i that's a i'm a big believer in that now lake trout lake trout are bottom feeders 
I go yes. dead bait for lip trout and like the I bring up like cut bring up like suckers and like those things by the time you know third day you're camping out there those things are ripe and like they're giving off brown liquid and you know we don't bring dry ice or anything for them and like you still catch lake trout on that you mean like it's like disgusting (laughs) you hardly want to put them on your hook anymore you still catch lake trout on that I mean, I've seen ice fishing videos, underwater camera footage of laying baits on the bottom, and lake trout will come cruising right in and pick that stuff right up off the bottom. Well, that's the best way to catch lake trout. But, like, at least that lit sucker was frozen. I'm telling you, man, like, three, four days in the boundary waters with no ice, your bait is just rank. <laughs> well, now we're, we're, we're starting into burbot season up here. My go-to, if I'm going to go burbot fishing, is I go to the local bait shops, and I uh, I have one of those uh, those great big uh, pucks, the big mm-hmm. one, and I just ask them for their dead. Yeah. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm burbot fishing. I mean, it's, you know, taking a lot, you know, paying for the live minnow when you're impaling three or four of them on a hook, you're just kind of wasting your money. And plus, I want that extra scent because yeah. burbot are pretty – their eyesight isn't very good. No. And it, it works out for me. The last uh, last burbot I saw actually was in open water was lake trout fishing mm-hmm. off the shore. Like, we actually got one pretty good size one once off the shore in June. Completely looking, different looking critter when they come from open water. Right now, they're super fat. I've mm-hmm. caught them where I've had to grab the burbot with both hands by the mouth to get them through an eight inch hole because they're just, it's, <laughs> just it's swelled, up. swelled up with, with, with spawn and all the, f- the food. I mean, and like set them down on the ice and their back stays pointed up mm-hmm. and they're just sitting on top of their gut yeah. now. And I've also seen, seen them open water, you know, early fall. Ooh, long skinny, nothing to them. <laughs> I prefer the fat ones in the winter. Yeah, who doesn't love a fat fish? Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's the way to go. But yeah, that's uh, no. I need to get I need to get out there. It's hard to find hard to find burbot around the uh, around the cities. So mm-hmm. that's the and I, the one thing too. It's like uh, it's a little, sort of a love the love the one you're with, right? Like I can fish as much as I want as long as I take my kids. And like if I don't take my kids, then they like get mad at me because they love to fish as much as I do. So that, like, <laughs> my daughter lives um, in Tennessee. She'll she'll be nine here next week, and uh, she comes up and spends the summers with me. Well, and she also comes up and spends Christmas with me. This Christmas, she begged and pleaded for me to take her ice fishing because the last time she was ice fishing, she was maybe four or five. And mm-hmm. she had to drag me off the couch to take her ice fishing. Now, in the summertime, like last summer, I, I bought her her own flow tube. And I watched this wave of independence go over her. She'd been in my boat with me before many times. But it was always, okay, Ellen, reel up. We're going to move here. Here, she was yeah. in command of her own vessel. And it, it mm. didn't take her long to figure that out. And then it was like, no, Dad, I'm going to go fish over here. And she would all proudly kick over there. And I'm like, well, do you need help with your rod? Oh, nope. I'll figure it out. (laughs) And it was really, really awesome. And I just had a conversation with her before I I called you up and she asked about her flow tube, if it was okay. And if it was still here. And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. It's still here. It's not going anywhere. And she's making plans to fish. She wants to buy a. She's been saving her money. She wants to buy a new rod and reel all her own. She's been using a hand-me-downs for me. Well, not really hand-me-downs, but I have plenty that she can use, but she wants her own stuff now, and that's you know, I, really cool. I had to buy my daughter her own fishing pole because before that, all the fishing poles were hers. So every time we got a bite, she's like, I got it. I'm like, I haven't caught a fish yet. She's like, you know, she's already setting the hook on it, whatever. So I'm like, I had to buy, I had to buy her her rod. So that I could catch fish, she's like she's like, oh, wait, get, I'm like get a bite. She's like, I'm like, it's mine. This one's mine. Like, <laughs> like you know, yeah. It's a team. I, I just decided it's a team sport, right? We just keep we keep scores a team. 
you know, we work as a team. So like, you know, I helped out, she helped out, but that's awesome. One of my proudest, one of my proudest moments was I, I said to one of the kids, I was like, I'm like, Oh, there's, there's a bite. She grabbed the rod, sets the hook. My son, who's half her age, so my oldest is eight. He grabbed the net. I took a picture of this cause it was adorable. And then I watched as she fought the fish all the way to the bank and he scooped it up. And my fishing buddy looks at me and goes, your kids just did that all by themselves. <laughs> I'm like, thank God they still need me to put bait on the hooks or they go without me. And, and you know what? That day is going to come. You know, that day is going to come where they're going to be like, dad, love to hang out with you, but we're going fishing. Well, isn't that the idea, though, is, like, we want to raise our kids to be better at things than we are, oh, right? Like, Absolutely. Like that. And yeah. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and not say that I am teaching my daughter that whatever's on the end of your line, if you're excited about it, be excited about it the whole time and mm-hmm. appreciate it. And so whenever she catches something that she's not familiar with, She asks a million questions and I try to answer all of them the best I can to instill Mm -hmm. appreciation for all of them. Cause I've told her, cause she's, she's even asked me, you know, dad, why do you like to catch rock bass so much? Well, Mm -hmm. I appreciate them. I think they're neat. I also, and, Mm -hmm. and she's like, well, you like to catch bluegills too. Absolutely. I like to catch them all, honey. And, yeah. and each one is unique. Each one is, has its own specific challenges. And mm-hmm. some of them are even bigger and yet harder to catch because nobody really knows much about them. And to mm-hmm. me, that's super, super intriguing. So I'm trying to plant that seed in there because there's been a lot of times where I have been fishing with somebody and they're, they're, I remember the first time I, I took somebody sheep's head fishing mm-hmm. and they were, you know, it took a lot. And then finally they were like, you know, all right, let's go. So we go and I set up and we're just fishing slip floats and leeches. That's how I've caught all of mine. And sure enough, that float goes down, sets the hook and, you know, he's fighting it and fighting it. And he's like, wow, this is really big. He goes, I think it's a big walleye. And I'm like, I hope not. (laughs) And he's like, what do you mean? You know, and then he gets it up and it's a sheep's head. And I'm like, yes, we got one. And he looked, he took it off. We took a bunch of pictures, let it go. He gave me a big high five and a hug. And he said, dude, I totally get it. You are on absolute giant fish with nobody around you. And man, was that fun. Mm Mm-hmm. And I've taken him a few other times. Now we haven't gone in in a few years, but it instilled that new, that new thing. And, and, and I've also compared that to the mass exodus that happens in the spring for sturgeon. Mm -hmm. Sturgeon are damn ugly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they are super popular because they're huge. Yeah. Now (laughs) I'm going, you know, I've been going up there and I get excited when I catch a big silver red horse. And mm-hmm. I've even said, you know, when the sturgeon, I've been up there when the sturgeon fishing hasn't been that hot. And I'm like, can we, can we target red horse? And I usually get shot down. <laughs> and I've asked the question, you know, I've, one of my best friends, he grew up up there and I said, is there any way I could target these suckers in the spring like this when, when walleye fishing is closed? And they're like, well, I suppose you could, but it might be dicey if you get checked by a game warden because there you are with, you know, a seven foot medium action rod where everybody else is using fiberglass, you know, giant poles and huge reels and 80 pound braid. There you are. You know, you'd have a, a lot of explaining to do. Just put a picture of a sucker on your cell phone screen, in your lock screen. And the, yeah, the guy, he checks you and you're just like, no, I'm sucker fishing. I see. And he's doing like, Ooh. Maybe yeah. I, I should set up a nice album with all kinds of rough fish in it and be like, here's what I'm about. Might Yeah. You know, and 
I, I'd be more than happy. I'm kind of afraid to not that I'm, I'm afraid of, I just, the hassle of it, you know, he, I'm taking yeah. up a pile of his time where he could be checking other things. You know, I've actually, I've never had that. I mean, I, I'm fishing. Uh, I start fishing uh, as soon as the creeks melt off before lakes have melted off. That little patch of open water in the springtime where mm-hmm. the creek dumps in is dynamite. So, like, I started fishing, like, then, and I don't stop until deer season. Yeah. Uh, and I've I've never, uh, yeah, I've, I haven't had any pre, pre-walleye, pre-opener checks. I was going to say, though, silver red horse are, like, those fish have, like, shoulders on them. Oh, like, yeah. Like, they are a big river, fast current fish. One of my best, uh, one of my best days ever red horse fishing. I just had caught, um, caught the run just perfectly, and uh, it was a weightable river and it was pretty clear. And I, I had my feet planted one, basically one spot, one rock bar, and I caught thirty silver red horse before I, I decided I'd had enough. You know, it's <laughs> like once you start keeping track, then you're like, well, now I got to get to thirty. <laughs> And, you know, like the small ones had to be, you know, four pounds, you know, like, and they just, you know, ripped in this current, like you'd hook one and they take off. And, uh, it was just, you know, a hoot. And I had, there was no one in sight up and down the river, you know? Um, and I was catching fish, man, if they'd had spots on them, you know, like it'd have been Instagram glory, you know, like mm-hmm. they'd have been brown trout or something like that. It's like. But, you know, they got these silver scales on them. I got the whole place to myself. And I just had a hell of a good time, you know, like, like, and they, those are, those are big fish. You yeah. Know? A, like, I, I don't know what, you know, it's kind of a mystery why, like, you know, not everyone's out there, <laughs> especially when walleye and bass season aren't even open yet. What are people doing? Gardening? washing their boat sharpening the taking inventory of walleye gear you know and i suppose there's crappies too there are yeah. crappies and crappies bluegills they're continuous year round i forget yeah i forget that um the... you know and 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 i've and i've said in my circle too and i just had this conversation with with uh with a relative of mine uh you know just the way i think like i'd rather be good at a bunch of different things than really good at one thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that that's just how I work, you know? Yeah. Um, but, like, going back up to the Rainy River, it's a little bit different because it is such a popular spot, and they have that three or four, that three or, no, it's two-week season where you can catch and release the, the big giant walleyes and whatnot, and then that shuts down. That's when the sturgeon fishing kind of picks up. That's where I would, that would be the time that I'd want to sucker fish mm-hmm. when you shouldn't, I mean, you can, you can do whatever you, you want as long as you're targeting the right species. But out of like that crowd of sturgeon fishermen, there's one guy with a walleye looking setup. Mm-hmm. That's where, that's where I was like, man, I don't know if I want to take up their time trying to explain my love for silver red horse, you know? It's getting around though. They might have like... You know, now it's, you know, showing up in the House of Representatives and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, rockfish.com and uh, it's, you know, it's it's growing. So there's more and more people who uh, are are just kind of going with the, the tug is the drug and, uh, you know, enjoy catching fish no matter what shape their lips are. Yeah, so. and I've noticed that up around here, even, even in the ice fishing world with panfish. Bluegills, crappies, in in the burbot up here, yeah, it's super popular. But more and more people are just catching them for the gram, yeah, um, catching them just to say they've caught them. More and more people, in my observation, out on the hard water, um, are catching and releasing fish, which mm-hmm. is pretty amazing. At the same time, I am also a, a person of not everything has to be released. You yeah. know, there, there's harvesting can be good selective harvest i'm a big fan of selective well, harvest yeah no i i absolutely agree because the uh if you don't harvest anything 
and you don't really depend on it, you know, um, you, you know, it's, but if you, if you do harvest stuff, you know, it's like, well, you know, this is something that literally, you know, I depend on, I want it to continue, you know, in a sustainable fashion, you know, it's, I think that's a, an important thing, to, you know, and it, it's not just for fish, but like, you know, the environment and in hunting and everything else, it's, you know, we have a couple possible problems in the, you know, in the hunting and fishing community, you know, one is, uh, if recruitment goes down, you know, if our children don't take up the sport and if people don't come to these things, it'll fade away. Uh, if we over, you, you know, over harvest or uh, abuse the resources, that will also, you know, not be good for us. If we don't behave ethically, we are giving, uh, we're just giving a reason to the antis, you know, giving them the evidence that this should stop. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be that person who proves them right. 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 Like, um, yeah. And like, yeah, you know, harvest a few responsibly, celebrate your connection to, to the, to the land, um, you know, and, uh, have that connection like, you know, we have always had, uh, but don't, uh, you know, don't hate it, yeah. you know. Yep. Don't don't hate it. So. Yeah, I would agree, sir. I don't know if you can see. Can I come up and go? Can I come up and go sheep's head fishing with you? I want to catch a thirty-inch sheep's head. I. You know what? I haven't done it in a in a few years, but I'd be willing to uh, give that a go. I'm coming to Bemidji this summer. Awesome, man. Well, I was going to point this out. Up on my wall there, my very first Master Angler Award is a silver red horse. That was the one that set it off. I've got sturgeon, silver red horse, rock bass, bluegill, which I'm still waiting on the certificate. I got 11 and 3 eighths inch bluegill. Wow. Um, I've been trying for the 20 inch brown bullhead. I've gotten a few 19 and 19 and a half. That's a big brown bullhead it is Uh, that master angler list i don't know if you've looked at it some of it like a master angler walleye minnesota's 26 inches but a yellow perch is 15 (laughs) like what (laughs) like oh my god man um right i love the master angler program i think we should take another look at it i know it's not a a department of natural resources thing it's it's the uh, freshwater hall of fame uh there in in um little falls mm-hmm. but i think we should uh kind of look at some of those and maybe do some reevaluations on certain things right. uh, musky i think is only like 45 inches mm-hmm. for a master angler which is a nice fish but in if you live in musky country it's oh yeah i caught a couple of 45s and 47s People right. eyebrows start getting raised when you get on that fifty-two inch right. and above. But uh, you know, it's uh, eel part are listed on that master angler as well. You need thirty inches, which is a pretty tall order. Yeah, I have yet is. to get my thirty. I've got twenty-eight before. Wow, that's a, those are solid fish. But yeah, the uh, I did look at that because shorthead red horse is nineteen inches, which is a very nice shorthead red horse. Mm-hmm. Um. In some waters, that's probably unattainable. There, I've definitely fished in places where I've not seen them close to that. I also fish in places where, like, a 19 is is relatively common. Um, and actually, this, uh, I had a day this summer where, once again, my kids were, like, jumping on the rods. And they double-headered on 19-inchers. Like, um, oh. like, yeah, they each they <laughs> had the... Uh, couldn't get the couldn't get the second one unhooked, and I got pictures with them each holding these big uh, nineteen. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, I should submit submit them for some master angler. Um, so right now, my whole family is tied for personal best shorthead for twenty one inches. Wow, nobody has been able to. Yeah, so like whoever my family cracks that twenty one inch is going to be like king of the shortheads. But <laughs> yeah, like that's we get the most of those on the Mississippi with some other stuff thrown in. Um, 
but that's that's those are just a good time for when when you don't want to go far from home you can yeah. you can always go to the river and get some short heads yeah uh, well, the the state record short head is like seven pounds or something like that and it's from the rum river and i looked at that and i was like that's clearly a greater red horse that was misidentified <laughs> Right. Well, and that's what's, like I said earlier, that's what's kind of inspired me to learn my sucker species is, and, and this goes back to to that legislative meeting that you guys had. You look in the reg books and it just says suckers. But then, yep. then you find, you find, you discover this master angler program mm-hmm. and they're all listed out. Yep, and you're like, well, it, and as I'm, t- I'm as I'm getting to know you and and becoming more uh, aware of of the rough fish species over the years, I've been like, can, that that can cause that causes me a little bit of confusion. They're recognized here on list a, a B, but on list A, pff, whatever. And yeah. list A, yeah. the regulations book is the one that everybody picks up when they get their license. Yep. And the, yeah, when you, uh, when you see that rough fish continuous unlimited, that's the end of a lot of people's curiosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the other thing that just kills me is that the, when you go to the, the rough fish definition, it starts with carp and then goes on. Right. And that has somehow that has given people the impression that that list is a list of kinds of carp. And so I am constantly being asked if they are invasive, if they are carp. Um, I had a conversation with one guy where I uh, we were actually looking at a commercial net, right? So we had different fish in front of us. And I'm pointing out to him, I'm like, well, you see the buffalo look like this. They're very black. You know, they have the white under their chin, you know, so you can see in the water and like they're, you know, very football-y shaped and like, and see there's a carp over there. And you can see how they're yellow and their scales have dark patches, dark lines at the bases. So like a crosshatch pattern. Mm -hmm. You can see this even in the water, right? It's very different. And I'm explaining all this to him and he's nodding along. And he's like, well, wait, are buffalo a rough fish? I was like, well, they are technically a a rough fish. He goes, oh, so they are carp then. And I was like, like, no, no, I just explained to you how they're not carp. Uh, I actually had to beat him with the buffalo to get him to understand. <laughs> well, and now there's different kinds of carps. There's grass carp. Yeah, but we don't, in Minnesota, we don't have grass carp. So, like, we right. have common carp. And then, like, we have the big head and the silver, possibly, maybe. And they shouldn't, I don't even know why they're called carp, because they don't look anything like the common carp. I was just going to ask you. Them. I was just going to ask they're, you. I can't remember what the gene is, but like, I feel like that's just a label that has gotten put on fish that come from animals. Well, like, could it be? Could it be said that the 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 name carp could translate into trash, unwanted? I I doubt it because over there and in Europe and where you know everywhere else in the world they are highly prized, and when they were brought to Minnesota, they were also highly prized. Um, the, there's a really good article called without careful consideration. And it's the history of carp in Minnesota. Um, and the, they, they go back into the, they go back into the old fishing reports and pull out the, the quotes from the people who brought carp to Minnesota. And they just are so excited about these German carp. And how like they're so uh, they're so fecund. They like you know they're um, highly prized. And um, actually, Meat Eater did a uh, a thing on a part of my plate where they also talked about some of this. And they said the um, part of the problem was that like once carp became very abundant, the cost, the price for carp uh, in the market tanked. Tank. So they became a food of the poor. Right. Before that, they were hard to get and they were considered a delicacy. But once the price tanked, well, now only poor people would eat them. Um, and and that that is, you know, like, so the, it's just, 
I would really like to see, though, if I had to, you know, nobody asked me in the committee hearing uh, what the solution was. I don't know why. Um, probably because they had experts there to to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the uh, a regulatory system that separates out are invasive species from native, right? Mm -hmm. um, that allows harvest of uh, fish that are like sustainable. Um, there are certain fish like river red horse uh, or greater red horse that are long lived, very uncommon. They are threatened in neighboring states. Um, those should not be harvested until they've, you know, had a chance to rebound. Um, like the, you know, so like some sort of system. Preferably also like for like the river red horse or greater red horse, blue suckers, some of these fish that are like rare. I really believe that catch and release fishing is important because it actually allows people to see them, appreciate them and have a reason for them to exist. Right. Like that. Yeah. It creates I, an I, awareness. Right. I want to avoid the spotted owl effect. Right. Where like spotted owls became a nuisance because you can't do anything where there's a spotted owl around, right? And so then instead of being, like, a prized treasure, they're, like, something that people hated, mm -hmm. right? And if you m put things completely off limits, and then they just become a hassle, mm -hmm. right? Like, so, like, I really think, like, so when I filmed the B-Side Fishing show... Um, I did, I literally had, had to get, and I laminated it and I brought it with them uh, when we fished, I had to get an endangered and threatened species permit from the state of Wisconsin to go catch and release fish for these river red horse. Right. And, you know, since you're not allowed to actually fish for them now, like I can't just take people to go try and catch them on a fly rod and convert people over to these fish and get them to appreciate them and look me out. Right. Could, could you repeat that? We kind of cut out there. Oh, um, so in, when I got this, um, I had to get an endangered and threatened species permit state of Wisconsin to film the B side fishing episode. Mm -hmm. And because you're not allowed to catch and release fish for river red horse in Wisconsin. Uh, so that means I can't take you or anybody else who wants to go down and try to like catch and release fish for them. Right. Like they're a great target. They're a huge challenge on a fly rod because they're like bonefish, you know, like, you know, and, but I can't like recruit some, some people from the fly shop like, hey, let me, like, show you this great fly fishing target. They're super challenging because it's illegal to even try to catch one. Right. Like, and, like, that that bums me out, right? Like, I can't introduce people who to those fish who would be stewards of the environment who could go down and appreciate them, catch them, let them go, look out for them, make sure there's nobody else, like, down there snagging them and calling them carp. Like, yeah. Because, like, you can't, you know. Well, even in the fly fishing world, carp, you know, your, your, your common carp or even down south, you know, the grass carp, or I should say common carp, they're kind of, in the, in the fly fishing world, that's kind of a hard thing to do is to get carp on a fly rod. Mm -hmm. There's these wild, crazy trout heads that are like, all right, man, it's that time of year. Let's see if we can hook up with one. Super mm -hmm. challenging. You yeah. Know? Um, and, and I don't know how that came about. I think it, I think it was fly fishermen, um, in, uh, around Erie or Michigan or something like that, that started to bring awareness to the challenge of catching carp on a fly mm -hmm. rod. Yeah. No, they're super smart fish. They get super big and they're, uh, super hard to catch. And I am so, um, zoned in and I'm so like, uh, just taken up with like the native fish mm -hmm. that like uh, I used to fish for carp, um, you know, and still like some of the biggest fish I've caught are carp, but I just like, I can't enjoy it the same way I did. Cause I'm like, well, you are an invasive species. Right. Like, right. but like I, you know, like they do have, you know, especially 
in in waters that are already degraded, especially, like they do uh, they do have a tendency to take over in degraded environments. Like unlike a lot of native fish, which don't tolerate degraded environments. So I would love a regulatory structure that separated out invasive and native fish. You know, put some of them into a catch and release category. Have some of them that are like a these are good eaten category. Uh, you know, and then like have an invasive category. Mm-hmm. Oddly enough, smelt, which aren't invasive fish, and you can also net and whatever aren't on the rough list. Like it's you know like so it's it's weird. Like this rough list has one invasive fish on it and twenty six native fish. Wow. But it doesn't have other invasive fish like goldfish and smelt. Huh. Right? Like yeah. this list really yeah. makes no sense. Right. Right. And I guess you could maybe chalk it up to lack of funding. Um literally the list like the only thing that has happened to the list in the last uh literally since like 1909 is f- species have take c- come bleh, species have been taken off of it. Mhm. So like Turtles used to be on the rough fish list. Um, yellow perch used to be on the rough fish list. You know, now, just now, burbot have come off the rough fish list. Um, but they haven't added anything onto it. <laughs> so, right. Well, I did a podcast with, with Scott Mockentune, um, and we were talking about burbot and rough fish, and we got into talking about evasive fish. And I asked him straight up, being that we're so far north, were largemouth introduced here? And he didn't have an answer, and he was going to look mm. into it. So the largemouth bass could be an evasive species to Minnesota. Um, I mean, I, unless you know, I mean, I'd love to know. I, I'm just that. That's the questions I ask. Is I think maybe too deeply about stuff like this at mm. times. You know what I'm saying? See now, I have taken the stance that I will grant grace to, you know, all the fish that originally uh, lived within the, you know, arbitrary state boundaries of Minnesota. Right. So I'm like, I try not to quibble about, you know, what, what exactly, Uh you know, like in part because I actually like the records weren't kept. Like um, they, I have read the early reports and you, you can, they're available online. If you you Google it, uh, I think the Minnesota Historical Society has a lot of those old ones. You just look through them. But they, the early fish commissioner reports are just bragging about all the fish that have been stocked. Um, they're, they mentioned in there that like walleyes were apparently not found in any waters not directly connected to the Mississippi. So like they say in there that they introduced walleyes to Lake Minnetonka. Um Lakes up around Lindstrom, they introduced walleyes to. They bragged about how successful all of this was. Um, they said that uh, stocking brook trout wasn't necessary because so many people were stocking them privately. You could buy brook trout eggs through the mail. And so uh, they were like, well, you don't even need to bother. People are just putting brook trout all over. But we'll focus on, we will focus on introducing salmon to the Mississippi River. Um, you know, stocking the walleye, pike, perch, you know, everywhere it's not found. Um, they did their best to put uh, lake whitefish everywhere because that's really going to be the fish of Minnesota, lake whitefish. Um, but yeah, they they just mixed every, they just stirred the pot. And they just like wow. so yeah the yeah it's entirely possible that a lot of um, a lot of largemouth bass lakes are are introduced. Smallmouth weren't found in the boundary waters. Um, so, and like a lot of those, uh, boundary waters lakes may not have had, uh, walleyes in them either. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, I guess if you were to start looking really into that, then, you know, you're, you're splitting hairs, (laughs) you know, um, I I guess maybe deep down inside, I was just looking for that, that shot rebuttal back, you know, if I'm in a, in a, in a in a rough fish argument and be like, well, you know what? Your beloved largemouth bass that are evasive. They weren't even here. I mean, and here they're yeah, I mean, just coveted, you know? Right. I, 
yeah, th- I think you could throw that out and then they have to disprove it. I mean, like. <laughs> Unless they ask me to prove it and then there we are back at square one. <laughs> you know. No, I I think I found I can I can pass on to you. I haven't uh, gotten I I wasn't reading them for long enough fast, so I don't even remember. Like, but um, the it, a lot of those fish were just spread around. Like the irony is is that the 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 ones that are accused of being uh, invasive, you know, weren't popular enough to stock. So actually, like, you know, the buffaloes and the the suckers and stuff like weren't moved around as much because like. They weren't the prized, you know, you could buy brook trout eggs in the mail, but you couldn't buy buffalo eggs in the mail. All right. Well, I lived in Kentucky for seven years, and I remember stopping in at a tractor supply one time just to, I don't know, I was just kind of killing time or something. And here's this big sign, and I could buy a largemouth, bluegill, crappie, catfish from a pond. Yeah. You could just buy them right there like like we do – you know, the baby chickens at L&M Fleet Supply up here. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'm going to buy some catfish and bass and bluegills for my farm pond. This is kind of crazy, yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's, you know, yeah, one thing that uh, moving fish around has, has generally has uh, not always worked out well. And, like, <laughs> no. uh, even, like, the smallmouth bass in the Boundary Waters, like, they've looked into that. And, like, when smallmouth invade a lake trout lake, the growth for lake trout goes down, you know, it's like there's some really good bass fishing in the boundary waters. There's a lot of really good bass fishing in Minnesota, you know, and there's not, you know, not as much lake trout fishing. So like, it'd be nice to keep the lake trout lakes, lake trout. Right. Right. Wow, man. Well, you know what? We are approaching 10 30 PM. Yeah. You know, this is going to be just a quick, just yeah. a quick opening salvo. I think we scratched the surface. I think we just scratched the surface. I think you and I could could go for days if we could. We gotta we gotta do this on a uh, we gotta do this out looking for uh, sheep's head. And you come down, and uh, I will try to get you on one of those uh, master angler list uh, short heads. That would be awesome. Um, as far as I know, I've caught silvers, whites. Are whites generally very big? N- not is not there... generally like like you get an eighteen inch or something like that. That's a pretty good size one. Okay, then that's not the ones. I'm every once in a while on Lake Bemidji, you'll see a humongous sucker just floating there. Hmm. Like I'm talking scales like the size of a fifty cent piece, and I always thought they were whites, but they could be greater red horse. Or is there a lake red horse? Cr- no, it's greater. Greater red horse would be the would be the biggest one, especially up there. That must be what it is, because I mean, I'm, I'm talking some of them. It's like cruising around in a boat. Let's let's go look at that. Oh my god, it's yeah. huge. Um, so you know, I'm all about. I love learning. I love catching fish. Um, one of my goals this summer is both in on the fly rod. Um. I really love those things. I think they're really yeah. fascinating fish, and they're they're also a good species indicator. Uh, like if I'm hunting down big bluegills, I look for a lake that has a lot of dogfish or pike. We talked for like two and a half hours. We never even got to bowfin. Like we you know did what? Just... Maybe we <laughs> should start doing species specific stuff. <laughs> you know, a, a weekly podcast or something. But but uh, no, I'm man. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you, um, go ahead and just drop your, your, your Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and then we'll wrap this thing up cause four o'clock comes pretty early. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm getting up at five. Um, I am on Instagram, uh, at Buffalo underscore catcher. Um, follow me for, uh, native fish info and i will also uh be putting updates on the uh the no junk fish bill um that i got to testify for today um so yeah follow me for all the latest native fish news in minnesota i got my that's what that's why i'm on there uh i don't uh i don't post uh brands i don't uh 
tag anything. I'm not, I'm not in there to get uh, to be a pro angler. Um, I actually, I, I make sure to avoid that stuff because I don't want people to think that I'm uh, like in there influencing for uh, free fishing rods. And although if St. Corey wants to come out with a red horse series of rods, maybe I'd reconsider. There you go. Uh, yeah, not a not a pro staff, just the, just there for the fish. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking this time um, to talk to me. And I think you're right there at the beginning that uh, this is the beginnings of many conversations and, and, and I think a few fishing adventures together. 100%. 100%. We got to, yeah, spring can come soon enough. All right, man. Well, you have. Tight line. What's that? Tight lines. Yeah, you too, man. And uh, we'll talk again real soon. 